All right, folks, welcome once again. Happy Friday. Here we are at the end of another week, and here we are with another great Microsoft Networking Academy session. Today, I'm pleased to introduce um, part of the Azure Front Door uh, engineering team. We have Sharad, uh, Sharad Agrawal, who will be presenting for us. He is also joined by his colleagues, uh, Daniel Gicklehorn and David Kays in the background uh, for support. And we are going to be learning all about Azure Front Door today. I'm also excited to say that we have uh, a demo, which is really cool. If you are a propeller head like me, it's so cool to see things in action. I have not really seen Azure Front Door in action, um, so it should be a real treat for all of us. So without further ado, I will let Sharad take over and uh, present uh, the goods today. So good morning. Welcome. Sharad, are you with us? We're not hearing anything. You Sorry, I was on mute. There Sorry, you go. Yeah. That's yeah. all right. All right. Yeah. Welcome. So, Take it away. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Sharad Agrawal. I'm uh, the product manager for Azure Front Door. So in today's session, these are the top things that we will be uh, discussing or addressing. Um, how? I mean, these are some of the key challenges people uh, face when they when they're trying to deploy an application or a website or an API um, onto their own on-prem data center or, or on Azure. And uh, they want improved performance for their global users, especially for, and, and I would like to emphasize on the term global. Um, then <clears throat> correspondingly, people are looking for higher, higher availability of their web applications and their microservices in general. So it's not just people want the ability that, okay, if suppose one microservice is down, then I'm able to, uh, I'm not taking down that entire application or like it's not that I have to fail over all my users across the globe to another region. But, uh, but the uh, expectation is that I can individually fail over each micro, uh, each microservice as needed. Then uh, the third scenario that comes uh, uh, that's most common is also like it's, and, and it's gaining a lot of traction these days is the security and uh, how do you protect against any attacks. Uh, and on top of that, typically doing all of this, uh, um, your uh, routing, your traffic routing management, and all those scenarios in a very DevOps efficient and agile manner that you can simply automate everything. You can try something. You can if not needed, you can throw it away. Those are the kind of those are one of the other set of problems that people at times don't have very easy access to. And this includes having the real time logging, monitoring, and those kinds. Uh, so from Azure standpoint, today we have uh, a different we have different sets of products which uh, play in the load balancing space. Um, and uh, one of the key things that we have to, uh, I mean, this slide will tell you is how do we look at these? How should you look at uh, these different load balancers? In what context where they should be used in isolation or in conjunction with one, one, or, the, uh, one or the other? Uh, so we make the demarcation at a very uh, at two uh, two main pivots. One is global versus your regional load regional level load balancers, and then what is the type of application you are running? Are you running on HTTP versus are you running on any other protocol? Uh, if it's not, that is layer seven versus uh, any other layer, then layer three, layer four. Um, uh, so, um, so in terms of layer seven capabilities, we uh, we have front door which can uh, manage your traffic at a global scale. We can uh, provide um, global failovers. You can load balance across different regions using front door or uh, using traffic manager for uh, for if it's a non HTTP HTTP scenario, and you can use that in conjunction with application gateway or load balancer within a region. So. Within a region, you will have scenarios where then you have a VNet that you would want to route within, like let's say different VMs or different uh, instances that you're uh, that you're hosting within a VNet, uh, and you can use application gateway or load balancer again in that space. Um, I won't drill down too much into uh, the individual capabilities, but at a high level, application gateway again is a layer seven uh, has layer seven functionality, so you can do intelligent path based routing uh, uh, at application gateway uh, uh, layer as well, and then with load balancer, it's a standard. Uh, uh, Layer four uh, load balancer that you can manage across your different uh, VIPs uh, uh, dips within your VNet. So moving on um, on to the next section. So one of the key things we talk about um, with Azure is uh, the uh, how we leverage our global network. Microsoft has the second largest network out there in the world. Uh, we have the most number of regions. In fact, we have more uh, regions uh, with like compared to the other top uh, two providers um, uh, combined. Um, or we have a huge, our network includes a huge uh, amount of our own fiber and sub cable. It's not just we are leasing uh, that we have kind of uh, leasing or contracting the, the fibers with somebody, but it's, it's we have our own huge network out there. Uh, we have huge number of POPs, 130 POPs globally, and it's not 
uh, specific to like a particular region. We have we are kind of quite uh, nicely distributed across the globe. Um, and yeah, our express route uh, overall in general, it, the, the volume of express route partners that we're getting on a regular basis uh, in general kind of speaks of how wide our edge network is. So Azure Front Door, I mean, before we begin and talk about what is what overall this, the, um, uh, the service is, I mean, it's one thing that we, we would we definitely want to highlight is it's it's not really a new um, service out there. We've been there in the industry. We've been there uh, for our internal customers like Bing or Exchange or uh, all these different properties that you see on the top right for over uh, five to six years now. We started with Bing um, uh, around six years back. And we have slowly and steadily added more and more partner. We are adding more uh, workloads as we speak. Um, in general, I mean, this, so this is a battle tested. Uh, this is a well tested, and uh, it's still running in production live for all these different workloads that you're seeing, like including uh, a mix of consumer as well as enterprise traffic. Um, we have at peak, we are doing over somewhere around nine million requests per second. So we are bent to handle all that scale today. So at a very high level, um, Front Door is a, a global HTTP, HTTPS load balancer. And uh, one of the benefits you get is it, it can provide you instant failover. We'll talk more about each of these bullets in, in, uh, in, a, in a few seconds, but at a high level. So we have, uh, you can we can fail over from one region to another almost instantaneously uh, because uh, we uh, we do have, we have a mechanism of split TCP protocol. We terminate the connection very close to the users. So that gives the benefit of application acceleration at the edge of Microsoft's network. Because we deal with only layer seven traffic, that is HTTP and HTTPS, every other traffic gets dropped at the edge. And so it kind of inherently provides you a DDoS protection for any let's say, TCP attacks, uh, TCP send attacks and those kind of things. Uh, plus front door also gives you um, application layer security. That is, we have a WAF layer that you can consume um, and you can set up like things like rate limiting and we'll, uh, we'll talk more about it as we proceed. I already spoke about the uh, the uh, the kind of workloads we are dealing with today, like Bing and Exchange, Skype, Microsoft Teams, um, and that kind of speaks to the volumes of scale that we can handle, um, and uh, which inherently when people come up, uh, we have seen a lot of cases that come customers come and ask me like, oh, what is your limit for SSL offload and things like that. We don't really impose any limits on the SSL offload, um, and so we can do massive amounts of SSL offload for you. Um, Inherently, there is there is part of AFD that is also a CDN. So we, yes, we also do static asset caching. Um, however, uh, as we recommend for volume delivery of your static assets, we recommend that you should be using Azure CDN instead of AFD. But yeah, for your small JavaScript files for your application, and you don't want to have a multi, very com a different architecture for like small small uh, static assets, it's totally fine to have uh, uh, caching set up with Front Door itself. Uh, we, we allow you to do very easy uh, domain and certificate management for all your uh, domains, and uh, and it's easy to uh, it's easy and it's free to do all of that. Uh, we are integrating with more and more Azure resources uh, as we speak. Like uh, particularly, we are look we are we are integrating very strongly with uh, Azure App Service. But yes, we are building continuously building more and more and more integration with things. All of the past kind of scenarios like Kubernetes is well, is one of is something that we are building more into deeper integration with. Front door kind of gives you a centralized uh, application traffic uh, dashboard that you can manage all your domains, all your certificates, all your routes as to how this particular microservice needs to be routed, how this, uh, where this needs to go to, uh, whether it needs to be going to one, uh, like for example, one set of backends or another set of backends. You can do all of that via one single portal and then along with getting all the logs and metrics uh, for that. And yes, we, we, we provide you insights about your, uh, your traffic, uh, like where's the, where are the clients, etc. Sending uh, how much, um, what is the kind of uh, for each request that is coming in, which is the route that is getting uh, uh, selected, uh, which are the more popular backends, how much each backend is getting, what is the health of a backend, all that visibility as well you get with Front Door. Okay, so coming to the first part, which was the load balancing. So we, um, so this is one of the top scenarios that we talk about using, and we there are not many provi providers out there in the market today which can do this kind of capabilities. So each of our pops across the globe, they probe each of the backends uh, that the customer has. Um, so what this means is at this layer, uh, it knows which uh, what is the latency uh, for each of the uh, application servers or backends and uh, and whether it's up and running or not. 
So what happens is we know we based based on which one is the late the closest we can uh, immediately go to that particular instance. If suppose something is down, we because we are in the data path and it is not uh, a DNS based load balancing. What happens is um, we can fail over immediately, like in a few seconds time. As long as soon as we detect, like we kind of have to run these health probes for your service, like for all these backends. Um, as soon as uh, we verify using the health probes as we are sending that yes, that backend is indeed down, we can immediately fail over from there. Um, um, so I would touch base a bit, little more uh, on this. One of the key issues uh, people run into is uh, with uh, typical other load, global load balancing systems is that they are uh, DNS based. What that means is something somewhere is can anytime cache the DNS. A good example is, uh, and I keep uh, I, I use this very often. Uh, we 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 sometime back about six months back we heard a scenario where um, uh, Google Chrome, for example, um, caches the DNS for about thousand seconds. That's equivalent to around sixteen minutes. So what that means is, if suppose even if your uh, global load balancer has failed over to another DNS entry. Chrome will keep caching that. It will keep sending you to the same endpoint again and again and again and again up until that uh, it has to refresh the uh, DNS cache. Uh, and the same thing, it's just so the Chrome is just one example, but any ISP out there, any internet service provider out there could be caching the DNS at for any amount of time. Typically, in the worst cases, it, uh, they cache DNS for hours, uh, one hour or a couple of hours at times. Um, one of the other things we provide you is that we provide uh, an Anycast architecture. So all of our pops across the globe, um, all of them announce the same um, uh, domain for you. For example, each of these pops will say I'm www.contoso.com if your if contoso.com is onboarded onto front door. So what that means is automatically BGP will select the closest pop, um, and it also means that your uh, the the kind of DNS example I was giving you, it's just that. Uh, it's the same DNS entry no matter where you are, wherever you are located. If the failover also happens, this DNS entry is still the same. It's just that uh, because of any cast architecture, it goes to the nearest pop and from there without the traffic to your appropriate backend. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so overall there's a very high built-in scenario for failovers and uh, failover cases. Um, so this is how what I was trying to explain. So let's say you have um, um, users, they'll, the any cast architecture will automatically pick the closest pop. And then because of our health probes, we automatically pick the backend that is closest to that pop. If suppose that backend goes down, it will be based on latency, we'll automatically pick the next uh, fastest and most available backend and we'll route the traffic there. In the eventual case, it's very rare that we do this, these kind of, but if suppose we have to take down one pop for some maintenance issues or some this issue, some happening with the connectivity for that pop, uh, some peering links have gone down or things like that. Um, in, in such cases, what would happen is BGP again, because we are any cache based, it will automatically fail over the traffic to the next available pop. And so our architecture has a built-in failover at each layer of sorts. Okay, at this point, I'll quickly jump on to a quick demo that I wanted to showcase. Um, so uh, so here is um, a website that I'm running on, uh, on uh, Azure. Uh, so this one is running in central US. OK, and uh, so it will just give you that. Yeah, I'm running from Central US. And, sorry, uh, can't for, see it. I'm so sorry. So sorry. OK, so so there is uh, so so th there is this instance central uh, for the Central US, which is running uh, they have different web apps hosted. So this one says, yeah, I'm in Central US. Um, I'll go to another one, let's say uh, the Japan East one. Again, oops. so if I click on the other one, it will go to the Japan instance. And say, yeah, I'm from, I'm coming from Japan. Okay. So what I've done is, um, I will uh, go. I've created a front door profile, and if I go to this instance, it will, it will pick the central US instance, uh, uh, and I can show you the configuration as to how what I'm doing here. So uh, in this particular case, what I'm doing is I've oh, oops. Uh, so I've created a, fr a front door demo. That's the uh, default hosting that we get. I've added a backend pool. It has all these um, app services and web, web apps that I've created. There's one for Central US, Japanese, uh, Southeast Asia, and UK South. Um, and then uh, I've defined some other settings for load balance. We can ignore those for now. Uh, but uh, 
So at this point, so any traffic that hits this can go to any of these uh, backends in, in this backend pool. And that is that state is defined in the routing rule, which is where it's saying uh, for any traffic that comes to front door uh, demo.azurev.net, send it to the backend pool, my web apps pool. And you can accept both HTTP and HTTPS, and this should happen for any traffic. That's the slash star. That's the path pattern that we will match. Okay. Um, I can also show you that there is no caching enabled. Both caching and URL other parameters are all just disabled. So what's happening is, uh, if I'm hitting that front door instance, it's automatically going and picking the closest uh, backend from uh, uh, from my perspective. So okay, I'm sitting in Seattle region. So what happens is it pips, picks our Seattle, uh, our pop in Seattle region in US, and from Seattle it, it it is probing all the backends across the globe. That is the UK, South, Southeast Asia, Japan, and uh, uh, Central US. And yes, Central US is the closest one from me. So that's where the traffic gets routed to. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just in this case let's say I'll just stop this particular instance of Central US. So at this point, what would uh, what this means is um, the web app, the uh, the website has actually stopped. So our health probes that we have configured with front door, that will um, those will start to fail. Uh, and I can show that to you as well. So um, and I'll I'll explain what what I'm trying to do here. So in this particular case, we have set up that we need to send a health probe every 30 seconds, and we'll be uh, doing we'll be sending uh, we need four samples size to define whether a point is up or not. And if two of them are healthy, then kind of uh, we we consider that uh, backend to be healthy. Otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise we'll call that as a failure. Uh, and that's the time I was like when I'm explaining this. I'm, I'm we are we are running those enough health proofs so that the failure we did we actually identify that that particular backend is down. Uh, now in this particular case, going to the website directly, obviously it stopped. Uh, Sorry, this is the Japan one. If I go to the central US one, it'll say that it's stopped already. Versus if I go to front door, um, it'll you'll, you can see that in the in the one minute span that I was talking about it, it has actually failed over to the Japan East uh, instance immediately because it's uh, um, we detected that the backend is now unhealthy, and so we it's it's time if we can we, we immediately failed over to the next available instance. From here, sitting on Seattle, Japan East is closer than maybe going to UK South or any other region. Um, so, so yeah, so that's that's the scenario I was trying to explain. That's the fast failover scenario. You don't have to worry about uh, like minutes and minutes for your failover to happen. Uh, if you want even faster failovers, uh, you can you can improve your, you can increase the frequency of when how we send health probes. You can send it to you can set it to as low as five seconds. So we'll send a health probe every five seconds. But then that means that more and more health probes will land on your backends on each of your backends uh, from each of our pops. So you have to be wary about how how you're tweaking this. Uh, you want faster failover, or you want uh, you want even more faster failover, or you want you're okay to take more load uh, in your uh, in your backends. Okay, so that's that was my uh, demo for uh, the failover scenario. Let me quickly go back and start this guy. Okay. So the next thing we talk about is uh, app acceleration. Um, so we have been uh, the way we do this is we kind of terminate the connection very close to the users, um, and then from there we run these long-running connections to the backend from each of our pops, uh, and that kind of takes care of uh, improving the performance uh, in terms of the client connections from client to us, our pops, and then uh, because there is the connection gets reused, this uh, this uh, and then an increase in performance even from our pops to the reaching the backend. So overall, net net you get a lot of performance benefit. Um, there are things that we have been constantly doing in terms of, um, uh, let's say, supporting HTTP2, SSL resumption, TCP fast, all these things that uh, we are we already support, and these kind of give our showcase our commitment towards further optimizing uh, our infrastructure overall as to how we how we can make uh, the client uh, the performance the uh, end user performance much much better. Um, I already talked uh, talked about the Anycast architecture, so that also kind of helps in some way uh, in terms of picking the best uh, the fastest uh, op of ours. And then from because we uh, the routing that we are doing at a global level, it's not uh, based on some just fixed hard coded DNS routing or from for US users send it here for something else and it's we actively monitor and understand which is the closest backend, and so we are sending the traffic to the closest backend. So that also gives you a performance boost in at both at both layers basically. 
Um, in addition to that, because uh, we use our van uh, for the routing, and I'll explain that, we have been constantly optimizing our van. We keep monitoring our uh, global network as to when is it always taking the most optimized path or not uh, from reaching one place to another. So I'll explain how this overall happens. So imagine you're not using any application delivery network. There are there are uh, some of these uh, uh, so these terminologies between content delivery network and application delivery network. One of the key differences is content delivery network is or the CDNs are more uh, used now for static asset caching and not really for dynamic object delivery as much. They're not really meant for handling. Uh, they're not really the term is not really used for uh, explaining what is the uh, how do you uh, manage your traffic globally? How do you route your traffic and all that? It's more mostly to uh, get uh, to support downloads of your cached object uh, or your of your static assets. So if you're not using any application delivery network, your clients travel all over uh, the in all open uh, all over the open internet to reach your backends. Uh, they can be seated anywhere, right? Uh, so every time an, an user has to make a connection, they'll make the connection over this long in open internet, uh, which is completely unoptimized, not reliable at all. Some ISP somewhere can be messing around with the routing table. There's a lot of zigzag pattern that happens. Uh, you can imagine this in a way that is, uh, let's say you're driving an Uber from, uh, let's say, um, London to uh, Milan in Rome, uh, in, in Italy. So. You're not those those services are not meant to handle those kind of long uh, unoptimized uh, travel paths. Uh, it's they are meant for short distances. So what typically any other application delivery network would do is that they will they have these all these pops set up across the globe, and what that does is these users these clients uh, establish the connect they terminate their connections very close to the users of that so that the TCP handshake the SSL handshake all happens very close to the user and it's super efficient. And from these pops to the backends, uh, because uh, we have we have these long running connections, uh, it gets reused again and again. Uh, there are also I can also explain how this benefits. But let's say there are hundred thousand users on this side, on the client side, in a particular geography. Uh, they are all making these hundred thousand connections to this pop, but this pop only needs to make let's say ten thousand connections to the backend. It doesn't need to make hundred thousand connections because the connections can be reused again and again. Um, so what happens next is uh, so, but then uh, the the challenge, if you notice here, is this path is still via the open internet. You have optimized by bringing the pops very close to the user uh, to one part, but this is still happening over the open internet. The key benefit that you get with Azure Front Door is that we leverage Microsoft's uh, global network, and as I've said, we are the second largest network out there. We have a huge network. Um, that kind of immediately brings in a lot of uh, network reliability because now all these connections are happening uh, over our network. So you're getting a, like a dedicated freeway of sorts for your own use case. Uh, and then we take your traffic on a pre in a premium way onto your backends. Even if your backends are not, not hosted in Azure region, uh, we take it to as far as possible uh, on our network and then we exit locally to the nearest peering point so that it can reach to your backend. Let's say if your backend is sitting in uh, Atlanta, we don't have, Azure doesn't have a data center in Atlanta area, but we will we'll take it to as close as uh, 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 some uh, wherever our network reaches in near Atlanta, and then from there we'll exit locally and kind of uh, uh, go with the peering links to the different ISP hops, etc., and reach your data center. Okay, so uh, so that kind of explains the why that the performance boost, and I can give you a ex uh, simple example. Uh, for this case, one second, I'm just trying to. And uh, okay, so uh, I'm trying to showcase that in, on one on the right hand side, we are actually going through front door. Uh, and on the left hand side, I'm going to an Azure region directly. So this is the same AFD demo central US uh, website that I had uh, that I was showing the failover for that uh, I'm hitting directly going to that uh, uh, endpoint versus uh, I'm going to via front door. And each of these cases, I'm pulling a 100 KB object and I'm doing this 50 times on both sides, right? Uh, as, I, as I showed you in the uh, in the profile in the AFD co profile configuration that there is no caching setup whatsoever. So every time I'm hitting, I'm going to the uh, to the backend and pulling this 100 KB object, um, uh, 50 uh, like on both sides, one wire front, uh, wire front door, one without front door. So I'm gonna. Um, so I've started both of these. 
see overall how this behaves. Um, and so you will see very soon that overall, there's a connection warm up that, that I was saying that the connection gets reused again, again and again. You will see an acceleration that is coming by default using front door. And I'm doing this live demo over a Wi-Fi network, which typically is very scary, but uh, uh, you can see on a consistent basis that um, our front door has already like it's way past the the performance that you're getting from going to Azure region directly. So what you're seeing here is uh, front door has already finished. On an average, for pulling a hundred KB object from the web, uh, from the website, we were taking around 0.55 seconds uh, based on my whatever Wi-Fi network that I'm there. Uh, versus in this particular case, I'm seeing some net, some failure as well happening here. Uh, but yeah, versus in this case, it's taking points. So on, on an average in just this live demo that I've done right now, we are saving around 300 milliseconds every time that we pull this 100 KB object. So I hope it should be a good use case. Yeah. So this is this is an example that I was trying to showcase in terms of performance acceleration that you can get. And uh, yeah, as you get more traffic, as the connection gets to use again and again, the more benefit of benefit you can start seeing. Okay. So, um, so the next thing we want to talk about is um, is application layer security. So I already spoke about that we are a layer seven service. We only handle HTTP and HTTPS traffic as of today. So what that means is any other um, traffic that comes onto Azure front door uh, uh, instances. Let's say if somebody is trying to do a TCP send attack, those kind of things. Um, we will drop all those other traffic. We will not entertain any of that traffic. All that traffic gets dropped at the edge layer itself. So it doesn't um, um, even enter your application boundary of sorts. You don't. It doesn't need to come to your application layer, um, maybe within uh, your data center or whatever that is. So kind of gives you a, a layer for DDoS pr uh, protection. Then um, there are other vast capabilities that we have. So there are two sets. One we provide. You can author your own custom rules. You can do things like IP restrictions, geofiltering. You can do to be parameter based things um, and all of this uh, you can configure as many rules you can order them into like this is this is high priority is a lower priority uh, and then uh, in addition to that we are we also have this co concept of our azure managed rule set which is a pre-configured uh, set of uh, attack definitions like we know that attack vectors we know we are aware of things like sql injection cross-site scripting and all that that we are um, and we are continuously adding on to that infrastructure uh, but then that is to protect you against all these um, uh, any other attacks um, that we know that that are very common. Versus the custom rules for are for your own use cases that you know the typically you have seen for your application that there are any particular attack vectors that you see. Was there questions? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, we also provide you rate limiting functionality. So what you can do is you can uh, limit the number of uh, requests that come onto a particular web. Uh, sorry, or, or onto the front door profile. Let's say if you have configured www.contoso.com onto Azure front door, uh, and you have said that I, I don't, uh, for my user profile service, uh, which is a path in the domain, so uh, www.contoso.com slash user profile service, you don't want any uh, user to be sending beyond 10 requests per minute. So you can configure at a per path level, so how much, uh, uh, what is like that they are not able to send beyond 10 requests and we can apply this configuration overall in a global sense um so yeah so this is this is a cool way of doing rate limiting for your application you don't want to bomb you don't want to allow different users to just bombard your application um so we uh, with each of these rules you can choose to block allow or kind of monitor kind of the what the behavior will be and uh, maybe take actions later. You want to maybe when you're onboarding, you want to just monitor how the behavior is. And at a later point, when you feel start feeling comfortable with those rules, you can actually say, okay, I want to now block these kind of IP addresses. Uh, as you said, we have we are integrating with all of the Azure monitoring systems. We have, we'll provide near real time logs and metrics for all the traffic that you uh, that you send to us. Okay. Um, moving on. So the other key benefit that you get with front door is um, or uh, global uh, level uh, domain and certificate management. So you can onboard hundreds of custom domains on an uh, on a front door, and then uh, we don't charge you for uh, these custom domains. And then you can also have your own custom certificates, like bring your own certificates. Uh, you can that is your own custom certificate, or you can request a certificate via us. We will con uh, we have a partnership with DigiCert 
uh, on your behalf, we go and request for a certificate from DigiCert. They'll issue a certificate. We will store it in uh, our own uh, Azure Key Vault instance. We will maintain, manage, auto rotate that certificate. All of this happens at free uh, for free. We don't charge uh, anything for whether you bring your own custom certificate or uh, you use our uh, the free certificates that we provide or for the custom domains. So it re really becomes one simple and easy mechanism to manage all of your domains and certificates as well. Okay, that's a, and I'm seeing a lot of use cases coming because of that. Um, a lot of customers reaching out to us for, for that kind of capability. So yeah, uh, so that's uh, at a high level, those are the top things that I wanted to cover. Um, you can, there are different ways you can architect your application. For example, if you're trying to build a uh, very highly available, globally highly available and performant application, uh, within your region, uh, you can use application gateway to kind of uh, uh, manage the traffic, uh, the, the layer seven traffic within your VMs or within your microservices within there. Um, if you are using Azure web apps, websites, you can directly integrate with front door you, uh, because they, uh, you, you, you already have a public web in front of it. So you, you can, we can directly do all the load balancing across the websites, across regions. Um, and then uh, if you are, do, as we said, if you are doing volume, uh, volumetric uh, static asset caching, that those are the scenarios that you want to uh, talk about, then uh, we, you can also use Azure CDN in general. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's at the high level what I wanted to talk about. Uh, there's another question that typically comes to me uh, as to how do we manage, how do we route the traffic? What are the kind of traffic routing methods that we have? And uh, give me a second, I will just. Um, so yeah, so this is, I've also written, there's also a blog, uh, a documentation page on this, but I, uh, this is certainly something that has been uh, uh, getting a lot of asks. Uh, people have asked me for, for this, but yeah, we have a good documentation already, but let me explain how this happens. So let's say you behind that domain that I was showing you, there are six, uh, there were currently four, but let's say there are six backends, uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Let's say C is actually uh, failing. There are, it's failing health probes. There's some, some of this that's happening in C. And then E you have disabled. It's a, maybe in a new region, let's say you have brought up a uh, instance, let's say in the, um, let's say in the Brazil region, but you're not ready to take traffic on it. So you've disabled that backend for now. So ultimately what happens is after that, so we, we look at all the available backends. So that becomes A, B, D and F. The next thing that we look at is the priority part of things. So what is the priority that is assigned to each backend? So the priorities field typically gets used for, uh, you can do your active passive configurations using this. That is, uh, so what we do is if there is any backend which is uh, having a lower uh, value that is that is higher priority, uh, we will not send any traffic to the lower, uh, to the lower priority uh, backend. So what this means is let's say A, B, and D had a priority of one and F had a priority of two. So we will not send any traffic to F. We will only send the, the next in the next, like as part of selection, okay, what are the, what is the backend that we need to send the request to? Only A, B, and D get selected. The next thing as part of this analysis, our routing algorithm that we look at is the latency signal. So let's say from, um, uh, from the pop where the request landed, let's say in this particular case, when I was running all these demos, um, I was hitting the Seattle pop. Let's say from Seattle pop, backend A is 15 milliseconds away, backend B is 30 milliseconds away, and backend D is 60 milliseconds away. Uh, we have this configuration parameter in the uh, in the configuration itself, in the uh, front door configuration. Let me show you. So if I go here. Um, So you can see here, there's something called latency sensitivity in milliseconds. It's the default is set to zero. Uh, what zero means is always send the request to the fastest and most available bucket. Uh, but in this case, let's say if you have set this to 30 milliseconds. So what that means is from the closest backend, that is A in this case, uh, add 30 milliseconds to that, that is, so your range become between 15 milliseconds to 45 milliseconds, send traffic between uh, those ranges. So automatically D gets knocked out at this stage because D is further than 45, uh, 40, uh, that 45 milliseconds. Mark. And then between that, we uh, you can assign weights or uh, these are kind of coefficients that you can attach to each of your backends. And then you can route, you can distribute traffic between them in that ratio. So finally that, that weight gets picked up. And so in this particular case, uh, the traffic will be distributed between backend A and B in the ratio of five is to eight. For all the traffic that lands on the Seattle pop, that's, that's the traffic distribution that would happen. 
So yeah, this again, this is again one of the important, uh, like very commonly asked questions that people have. Uh, so how do you guys do routing? Uh, so this, I'll, I'll try to explain that. Okay, uh, I haven't been looking at the questions, but um, any questions that are open, Daniel, you have been answering. That's all from my side on the demo. If there, and please feel free to shoot any questions that you may have. Uh, Thanks, Shira. That was awesome. I have a few questions just uh, top of mind, and then, of course, would love for others to um, to come in and, and weigh in as well. Sure. While we're on the topic of um, all these various load balancing uh, algorithms, I can see a lot of value in them. I can also see a lot of value in being able to kind of combine them in a, a nested way or bucketized way. Is that something right. I could do? Could I say have it available back end as a primary and then use latency as a secondary? Come again? Would it be possible to, uh, yes, just to nest these profiles so that I have, you know, a primary algorithm um, that takes first shot and then a secondary algorithm that would take a second shot. So, for oh. example, latency would be powerful to combine as a second thought process against, say, priority or available backend, right? So profile nesting? Uh, no, so at this point, no, we, we don't have that functionality where in, uh, uh, you can kind of nest these profile configurations. All uh, we kind of, I mean, our assumption, and I'm, I'm, we we can be wrong here, but our assumption is that we are, uh, we uh, we have a very good routing algorithm that that can route the traffic in the most optimized way for end users. Because we talk about performance improvement for the application, but yes, at as, at at this point, it is a limitation. You can't even uh, you can't even flip the order of this. Like we can't pick priority after you have picked latency as well. So that's also not allowed. Uh, so this is there's none 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 uh, other than the latency sensitivity part of this uh, and the weights part of it and the priority field part of the configuration values you can't change the order or the algorithm at all right now and layering won't really help. Okay, and then one other question um, yeah. that that kind of occurred to me as we were going through this, um, I really love to see how you are partnering with all these different PaaS services as backend pools on the back end and continuing to grow that ecosystem. That was really exciting. Um, could you help explain to us kind of what exactly my backend pool could be when I define it? And you may have done this and I just kind of probably glossed over it, but what does Azure Front Door want to see? Can I, is it an FQDN? Is it a public IP? Is it a private IP? Uh, how do we yeah. go about uh, setting that? Yeah. So let me showcase, let me showcase if I'm trying to add it back in. So you can add, so typically we have, these are the immediate ones that the, the natural ones we have provided like app service or a cloud service instance or a storage or classic storage account, or you can provide a custom. So if you sub select app service, it will give you all the uh, app services instances that are there in this particular um, subscription. And you can, again, you can choose a different subscription if you want. Uh, but if you're, if let's say, because I already mentioned that we, uh, front door is not restricted to backend sitting on Azure. You, your backend can be sitting on, let's say, your own on-prem data center or with other cloud providers like AWS or Google's any place. Uh, so in, if, let's say, if that is the case, you can define, uh, you can set, set the backend um, uh, accordingly. It can be an FQDN or it could be an IP. Uh, these FQDNs are always considered better because, let's say, for your application, if you're changing an IP or something, that it's, it's a bit, it gets a bit risky. But um, you can you can you can provide each, either of those. Uh, the the only restriction we have is that whatever you provide should be publicly accessible. So whether it should be a public web, uh, publicly available web, or a publicly available FQDN. So it, uh, that's the only limitation. Front door cannot route to your private IPs. All right. So that's my design. Yeah. Well, thanks. I will get out of the way and, of course, uh, let others. Um... I, I have a quick question. Um, how about with the express route, since you mentioned uh, it's not compatible with the private IP. Um, yeah, so so I'll, exp uh, I'll take this. So front door, um, so the, the way Express Route works is, let's say from your regional um, offices and things like that, you have an Express Route connection to Microsoft's network, and then from there it gets routed to your particular IP. So if you're using, uh, if you're using uh, Express Route for your, um, for your uh, patterns, which are like a private IP sitting in Azure, then yes, Express Route and Front Door will not be able. To, you can't have Front Door and Express Route work together, uh, it, because Express Route will. Uh, or, so there, there's also this issue uh, concern that would happen, which is uh, Express Route is a direct connection. So to a particular uh, pop. For example, if uh, let's say I'm sitting in, uh, let's say your regional office is in uh, Atlanta, 
and uh, you have an express route connection to the Atlanta POC. But let's say your you are your network will always take you via the express route to uh, to the wherever the edge location that is for the express route. Uh, we are our anycast architecture kind of gets useless because of this behavior. No matter what we try, it will always enter via one single path to to the POC wherever the express route connection is. So yeah, so it's frontal. Probably I wouldn't say that it, it works very well along with Express Out today. Uh, anybody else, David or Daniel, do you want to add to that? I don't I, I think my thought process as, as a network architect on that would be that Azure Front Door is meant to be a globally distributed edge play. Um, which is a different kind of motion than the private MPLS connectivity play, which is Express Route, right? Express Route is all about my private WAN having a fat pipe to Azure's private WAN. Azure Front Door Service is a, um, I don't want to say inverse of that, but it's a it's a different approach to um, exposing a surface area to to an end user base, right? Which is to distribute it globally as far as possible, um, you know, and then have acceleration is edge based play is supposed to say backhauling it in over a private pipe. So the two can be complementary in some ways, but if I'm deploying an application, I, you know, express route might not be the way that I want my application say to be deployed globally because that's my big, um, um, you know, connectivity mechanism for my core into Azure's core. Anyway, just my thought. Yeah. I, I, this is uh, one question I, I have. Uh, uh, I, I agree what you're saying, right? I mean, you express express route may not be the best way to kind of reach Azure Front Row, but if the question is, can we use express route Microsoft peering to connect to Front Row? Is it yes or no? I mean, like you know, I know it's not the most optimal way, but is it possible to do it or not? So, so you're, you are talking about uh, accessing a Front Door IP from your so on-prem data yeah. center through express route. Is that what you're trying to do? Yes, using Microsoft peering. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so if you're uh, if you're um, so if why Express Route connection you're providing an IP of Azure Front Door, then yes, that that is possible because uh, you, the Express Route uh, will take the traffic to. I mean, it, it it is a direct peering link that you have got with Microsoft Network, and because let's say for your application www.controsa.com, if you're announcing uh, from that same pop, it'll it will reach that network router in that edge site, and from there it will go onto uh, AFD, and AFD will route it appropriately to the backend wherever it is uh, present. So the Express Route is basically a connection from your network to Microsoft's network. So from there, yes, depending on what you're trying to access, uh, yes, it can. Uh, if the path is kind of on the, if you're accessing only by Express Route, then yes, that routing will happen. It may not, as as you as you also repeated that it may not be the best or most optimal path. path but yes, that is doable if it is publicly accessible. OK, thanks. So uh, right, the, there might be some other design considerations in there as well, right? Remember, Azure Front Door is any casted. So then the question is, how many regional BGP communities do I have to light up so that that any cast um, mesh works correctly for me over Microsoft peering, right? So because that any cast is effectively listening across a very wide surface area. So. Uh, that might not be the best approach for all people that are consuming the Microsoft routing domain, which means I have to basic, basically light up all regions in a globe or all all public BGP communities in a in a geo, and then that creates a, a fairly large uh, public routing table exchange. I mean, it's it's technically possible, but I found through experience that folks that tend to uh, favor the Microsoft routing domain are looking for a strategic public surface area, not a global public surface area, right? Okay. Yeah, agreed. So there was one question on client certificate certificates. No, we don't support client certificates today. Um, so uh, then there was another question on uh, how do we integrate with AKS uh, in this particular case. Um, so, but yeah, client certificates is on the roadmap. Uh, we are uh, we have we've heard some other uh, feedback uh, as well onto the same thing. Give me just a second. I'll I'll actually post. Um, I will share with you guys. Um, for feature requests, if you don't see any feature, please feel free uh, to please bookmark this particular link that I've just pasted on the 
uh, IAM window. Uh, you can file any feature requests for Frondo here, and we actually look at look at them very seriously. We, are, in fact, a lot of our backlog is getting prioritized based on the fe feedback, uh, the feature requests that we get here. Um, obviously, if it is like completely uh, something that that challenges our architecture or our design principle, for example, if the ask is around, oh, can you do uh, routing to private IPs? Yes, something that 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 probably will not get prioritized. Uh, prioritized. But otherwise, if it's a if it's something that we can do, like client certificates, yes, we have I've heard on other threads about client certificates, so that's definitely on our roadmap. But I don't have a timeline at this point. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about or show in your demo environment how to look at the metrics? So I'm particularly interested in cash hits versus misses. So I lit up um, AFD on a preliminary site. And I wasn't able to tell exactly how much better the performance was because using an external tool, it looked like everything was still coming from the same domain. And I couldn't tell if it was actually a name resolution issue or if it was actually going to the site directly or if it was using AFD. So could you talk a little bit about that? How we can what kind of metrics we can expose to show the performance gains? So um in in front door itself, give me a second. Um uh, so this is my front door. Um, so if you go to the metrics tab, you can actually view all the metrics that we expose for uh, front door today. You can pick any of the metrics that we have exposed, and we are adding more to this list. This is an initial list that we have uh, launched with. Uh, but you can see the health percentage. You can see the how many requests are getting received, uh, total requests count, the request size, the response that's ingress and egress overall. What's the latency that we are seeing in general? Uh, how many uh, WAF rules request counts that we have received uh, and all these metrics. And we would, again, feel free to uh, share any feedback in terms of other metrics that you would like to see. But yes, there, there's something that uh, definitely that we are, we are, uh, we are looking uh, to look at. One of the... Um, right, because, and, because, you know, it's cash hits versus misses. You know, you check the box for um, cash everything, you know, for the, the static content. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to tell if that's actually being served by AFD or not. Okay. Yeah. No. So uh, that is a metric that we today don't have about the cash hit versus cash miss. Uh, something that we know and uh, we are actually working on. Uh, we don't have that metric today. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but then we we showcase some of the top metrics. Like as I was doing the demo around that mid time frame. Yeah. Uh, so you can see that there it will show some spike as to how much traffic etc is getting received. Uh, which are the uh, backends that the traffic is going to? That uh, information should start showing up here. Yeah. Uh, and because I took down one of the instances, uh, I think that's why it's showing an availability drop here. Back in. Okay, so yeah, but uh, as I said, uh, if, if there are feature asks or there are more asks, uh, please feel free to, uh, please note that link that I've provided. Please share feedbacks with us on uh, on our user voice forum. We actually, we do take uh, take a look at them very seriously on a regular basis. I, I think I, I review them at least every week. Uh, uh, there was a question around integration with uh, Kubernetes. So yes, we are actually working very. Uh, we are we are we are starting to have some more deeper discussions with the Kubernetes team as to how we can build tighter integrations. But uh, AFD can be used. In fact, uh, in a few weeks' time, I'm actually working with somebody. We are setting up a demo, or a, we probably write a blog post about it as well. So how you can set up AFD as an as your ingress controller with your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, because we do all of the SSL handshakes. Uh, if you have, all you need to do is you need to have a public whip in front of your Kubernetes cluster, and we can route traffic to that. It can uh, across your Kubernetes cluster, maybe in the same region across your Kubernetes cluster, uh, across different regions, and load balance and things. So it AMD can be your uh, ingress controller, and also because of the rate limiting uh, feature that we have, it becomes a very strong scenario for for using AMD in front of your uh, Kubernetes application. Trying to go through some of the questions. So there was a question, I think, on Azure Stack related. Really. I don't know if it's. Yeah, I think David has already answered that. It, it should be fine, sir. As long as the con it's more to do what you are connecting to. Uh, if you're if you're connecting to a public instance, yes, we can connect to that. Uh, your Azure Stack instance should be allowing connections to AFD. That's that's but that's on your client side as to where your requests are coming from. Well, Sharad, thank you. 
this has been really informative and helpful. I'm really excited to see this platform come to light. Um, as Daniel said in the chat, this will be GA in March. Yeah. Very exciting. Um, well, that's clearly going to be in consumer. I don't know if we had mentioned, uh, you know, GovCloud. Is that also uh, part of the GA or is that going to be forthcoming? Uh, that's going to be forthcoming. I don't think so. We'll be hitting uh, uh, the gov clouds um, at the time of GA. We're also trying to understand um, from a high level standpoint as to what are the overall requirements that people may have in the gov clouds from front door perspective. We, I mean, we have one couple, a few scenarios that we know of or that we are aware of, but yeah, we're we're trying to get more uh, feedback around that. We haven't. So to be honest, this is the second time I'm hearing this ask. That's so we haven't really heard any ask okay with that front door uh, like from external customers we have not really heard any ask okay about present our presence in uh, in Gov clouds but yeah so we would definitely if there are scenarios customers have we would definitely want to talk to them and understand as to what what is the use case. All right, so for customers and partners on the call, if you guys uh, start looking at this service as uh, valuable on Gov cloud, just please let your Azure technology specialist CSA or, or any of your sales reps know. And we'll be sure to draw that to attention of the AFD team and they can uh, take a look at that. So uh, again, great demo. Thanks for the time. Um, it's very exciting to have a, a global Anycast engine. That has been something that a lot of customers have been very interested in. And I receive a lot of Q&A about just in my daily job. So um, this feels like a total home run. Um, really excited to see um, people dig in and start using it. So thanks again all. Um, Again, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to wherever you are. Have a great weekend, and we will catch you guys soon. Take care. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. I'll post the feedback link again on the window. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Yeah, bye-bye.